This is BIV Today, the daily business video show and podcast from the journalists at BIV. I'm Haley Wooden. My guest today is Dan Pontifract, the founder and CEO of the Pontifract Group and formerly the Chief Envisioner and Chief Learning Officer at TELUS. He is the best-selling author of three books, including Open to Think, and he's spoken about that one on our show before. Today, he's going to talk about his upcoming book, Lead, Care, Win. Dan, welcome back to the show. Thanks for coming on. Haley, thanks for having me in the midst of a pandemic. Who had who had pandemic on their 2020 bingo card, eh? Jeez. Oh my goodness. It's completely obliterated my bingo card, that's for sure. <laughs> the world's a very different place. Uh, I, why don't we talk about that first? This is such an unusual time. What can we learn about leadership from times of crisis like this one? Well, uh, as I've been saying a few times to my teenagers, uh, in the shadow of a pandemic lurks this wonderful opportunity. And you have to step outside of the shadow to actually look for it at times. So what I've been noticing is, finally, I should say, <laughs> a fair amount of empathy that has you know, taken over, if not been exposed, uh, on behalf of leaders because of the pandemic. I think there's just been this um, wonderful catalyst, which is ironic given the death and the tragedy that is the pandemic, but that leaders have finally woken up and said, oh my gosh, it's not just about me. Maybe I should be thinking a little more emotionally and effectively uh, on the feelings of how employees are feeling through this tragedy. So I think empathy is one of those things that have popped up, uh, thankfully. Yeah, it's very interesting. Do you think that's because of the nature of this pandemic, because it risks our health and our safety and our well-being, that conversations around well-being are normalized to some extent? Is that part of it? I believe so. In addition to, I think that's an astute point, Haley, the, the fact that it's almost leveled the playing field of our humanity. So, yes, I mean, uh, slightly more rich people perhaps are, 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 are able to, to live greatly inside of their larger homes, let's say, and, you know, have a little bit more room to work with and not in a 400 square foot condo. But at the end of the day, this affects all of us. It doesn't matter if you're five or 105. The virus knows no boundaries and it knows no limits. So I think that's sort of leveled the playing field, if you will, in terms of it affects all of us, which then allows leaders to say, oh, that could affect me. Maybe I should be thinking and feeling a little more about what my people are going through in their 400 square foot condo, or the fact that they're looking after their you know, elderly uh, parents, let's say, or they just had a baby. Oh my gosh, what's it like to have a baby in the middle of a pandemic? Oh, they're supposed to get married next week. Oh my gosh, what th that got canceled. Like, there's just so many points to this that leaders are almost forced to empathize with all the things that are going on out there. And pandemic aside, the book suggests right there in the title, caring should be part of how we lead and it's key to perhaps winning when it comes to leadership. Tell me a little bit about where and how caring fits into the leadership equation in the business world. Well, first of all, I mean, I could have titled the book Lead, Scare, Win. <laughs> and the reason being is that there are far too many leaders who believe that's how you win. You scare, you fear, you bully. You know, tragically, you are uh, pushing your team above and beyond their own bandwidth, their own emotional uh, intelligence, if you will. And it's creating the disaster that is disengagement and so forth that continues to run havoc inside of our organization. So, so that being said, uh, I didn't want to write the lead scare win book. I thought to myself, you know what, what we need a little more of, Haley, is some caring, not just empathy, but caring about how you come across as a person. And I'm trying to get inside of the book the notion that the word human is actually found in humanity. And it's also found in being humane. So if we act a little more human, humane, and sort of think about how we're, we're all in this thing called humanity together, yes, there are decisions to make. Yes, you kind of have to lead and, and be, you know, the buck stops here theory. But can we do it possibly, Haley, in a more benevolent, caring, um, concerning way? I, I don't, I never really understood why leaders put on that cloak of Teflon and think to, to themselves, oh, I, I am better or nothing is going to stick to me. I have a different character to show up to work with. And that's going to be the bully, the meanie, or the weirdo. I just, I don't understand. If you just cared about others, you'd be humane in the way in which you're treating both yourself and the team itself. 
I like to think too, even if you have kind of the Teflon coated leader in the business world, that those individuals, you know, do experience caring in other parts of their life, but have felt that they're unable to do that in the workplace. How do you advise people maybe start to break down the barriers they themselves impose and start to become a little bit more caring at work? Well, I mean, let's go back to the word humanity, right? So we all come from grandparents and parents. We all suffer some sort of loss in our lives. We, we all kind of go through the emotions of when we're um, thinking about, you know, what's happening in our community, in the environment, how are we, we're all plugged into an ecosystem. So if you recall as a leader that you are part of the ecosystem and not your own ego system, that it's not just about you, it is actually about us and others, start there and then sort of look around and say, well, how can I feel for them? How can I include them? How might I care a little more about where they're at and how might I be you know, more collaborative, uh, more open, more authentic, more me, more transparent than perhaps I've been doing before? And a lot of that, as we've noticed over the last 30, 40 years of leadership is a sort of a monkey see monkey do thing. And so if the leader uh, ends up you know, acting as uh, some sort of malevolent character, i.e. that bullying, that sort of command and controlling type of leadership, often what we find is that the team says, oh, well, if she's doing that or he's doing that or they're doing that, uh, maybe I should be doing that. That's how I get ahead, right? That's how I win. No, I think we can do a much better job of saying to ourselves as a leader, look, how do I recall and remember that I once was, you know, a meager human being and that I needed help along the way? And then what, how did I get to where I was at? Was it just because, let's, let's use a hockey metaphor because this is Vancouver, it's, you know, business in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So Haley, when, when I see leaders whom, who play for the name on the back of their jersey and not for the crest on the front, metaphorically, I know that they're, they're living in their own ecosystem. But if they play for the crest, that's the team, that's the ecosystem, that's looking out for one another saying, hey, how are we going to cross the finish line? How are we going to innovate? How are we going to help that customer, et cetera? When the leader's just playing for that name on the back of the jersey, good gosh, that is just the definition of ecosystem. Mm, that's a good point. One of the nine leadership lessons in the book is about relatability, which I kind of feel fits into this conversation we're having. Tell me why that piece, the relatability piece matters. Wow. Well, relatability, at least in my research and working with thousands of leaders, I mean, I've, I've been quite privileged in which to work with uh, some not so good ones and some great ones. The reason be relatable is actually lesson number one in the book is, is sort of to say to the leader, who are you and what are you bringing to work? Are you fake? Are you sort of fake news? Uh, are you that uh, catastrophic uh, command and control bully type leader who comes in and thinks they can lead, scare, and then win? Relatability is all about, again, that human beingness. And, and when I see people who try to fake their way or are, are demeaning, they're calling folks out, they're not sort of saying, oh, we're both on this together, this thing called life. You just you kind of lose the plot right away. And again, let's, let's, let's look at this. When we talk about being a human being, we know that each of us will one day end up at the proverbial waterfalls. So it's the metaphor for taking the walk, the long walk, and we all you know, end up in a, in a higher place, six feet under, whatever you want. So when we forget that, that we're actually just human and we're not being relatable for that journey through to life, through to the waterfall, what, what's the point of leadership? If we're not being relatable to the fact that we're all on that journey together, leaders got to get out of that leadership role then. They're not leading. They're not helping the team become more than what they should be or could be. And, and they're just in it again, back to the sort of egocentrism for themselves. So being relatable, first and foremost, is saying, look, we're humans. How can I help you become a better human being? I'm not here to hoard your talent. I'm not here to hoard budget, to build up an empire. I'm here to help. And how can I do that? That's being a human being and being relatable, first and foremost.
Mm -hmm. I have in my mind that trope of the boss that just wants to be everybody's friend and will hang out with everybody in the workplace and pretend that they're really one of the team. It feels very opposite to the, the me, me, me or the egocentric boss. Does there have to be a balance there where the leader is maybe a little bit separate, focused on different things, but they're still very much a part of the team? What are your thoughts? Yeah, and that's why I think I believe that the the, the nine lessons actually parlay and, and build upon one another. So later on in the book, uh, two of the other lessons, one is command clarity, and then uh, the one that follows that up is commit to balance. So you're right, you know, there's a pendulum where you've seen the, the joker boss who thinks everything's you know, comical, wants to go have beers every Thursday, Friday until the wee hours and wants to be too much of a friend. Well, that pendulum has swung too far to the left or right, whichever way you're looking at that. And, but again, um, we need to be able to commit to the balance of, well, what is the fine line? And yes, where the we talked about this just a few seconds ago. When the buck stops here, leaders still need to make decisions. But if they're not balanced in the appropriate sort of uh, summation of people's ideas, and they and they don't use you know their thoughts on how to make the decision or how to get to the decision, well then that's when things start falling apart. So you're absolutely right, Haley. You can't be too much of a friend. Uh, you can't be a jerk. There's this fine balance in between. But the whole uh, the other notion there, I'll just touch on about commanding clarity. You can't sit on the fence either. So what what happens to a fair amount number of leaders is they suffer the proverbial um, paralysis by analysis, and you know they're sort of a bit meek. And then the team looks at the leader and says, "Well, are we ever going to make a decision around here? What's happening?" So they they've kind of lost the clarity of where they're going, the vision, et cetera, and then they end up looking like a bit of a Dilbert doofus because they have none of that uh, uh, commanded clarity. So they all build one another and they get to a point of how you can become more caring with yourself and others. Right. Thinking about this pendulum swinging, is it okay to get it wrong and make mistakes? I imagine for a leader who's maybe reading the book, working through the lessons, applying them and realizing, oh, that was too far. Oh, I get what this means now. They're going to make mistakes. How do you manage that as a leader? Well, there's first of all, there's two types of mistakes I've identified in the book. One are simple mistakes and, and the other is complex. So a simple mistake is you, know, you forgot to answer their email. Uh, you didn't follow up with the voicemail that they left. There are things where you've just forgot, uh, maybe not purposely, almost un- unconsciously, you know, but we make them. We make them all the time. Sometimes, you know, you forget to hold the door for someone because you're looking at your phone and next thing you know, the door slams on their face. That's awful, but it's a simple mistake. Just quickly apologize and say, my bad, uh, you know, as opposed to forgetting or as, effect- for, uh, as opposed to sort of sweeping it under the rug. But the complex mistakes are a little bit more uh, dire. And they really require more than just the simple apology and the very proactive and don't forget type of apology. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm not really a huge Kentucky Fried Chicken fan per se, but KFC in England about a year and a half ago ran out of chicken in, in their like 250 stores. And it was a colossal management mistake. Uh, a complex mistake with their suppliers, partners, etc. So for about four or five days, there's no chicken, <laughs> yet you're KFC. So the senior leaders got together and said, well, we, we should probably apologize to our customers as well as to our suppliers because it's our bad. We just completely messed this up. So they, they took out ads in newspapers and Twitter and so forth that rearranged KFC to the letters uh, F-C-K, <laughs> a little exclamation mark. You know where I'm going with this. Right there, it's like er, F word, essentially. And then under it was a massive apology of, of what they did wrong, as opposed to covering it up, right, and saying, you know, we didn't, there was no mistake here, and blaming someone else, which, again, leaders really like to do. It's not my problem. It's theirs. They owned it. And it was a very complex mistake. But again, similarly, they apologized and took responsibility for it. So Haley, to err is human. Remember we talked about human just several moments ago? Mm -hmm. So to admit to mistakes, whether they're simple or complex, means you are apologizing and admitting to and saying, what can I learn from this? Setting the example with your team that it's okay uh, to make a mistake, but it's better when you admit and then make up for it and figure out how to do it differently next time. You own it. Own your mistake. You own it, indeed. 
one of the other lessons that really resonated with me at this point in time, embrace change. There has been a lot of change now, some of it irreversible, still a lot of uncertainty about the world we live in. How can leaders cultivate a mindset that takes adversity, that sees disruption, and really frames that challenge as an opportunity to embrace change? But yeah, I think what the pandemic has taught us a little bit, right, is that, yeah, uh, change is persistent. And so much as maybe people weren't planning for a pandemic, but it came and it forced us to think and act differently. So maybe, again, what the pandemic is allowing us to recollect and to think about differently going forward is not for the next pandemic. I mean, that's horrible type of thinking, but that... If, if we've been able to make changes and accommodate those changes within the pandemic, can we not have that type of thinking systemically going forward? So again, in the, the, the ironic beauty of the pandemic is that it has forced us to embrace change as leaders, as teams, as organizations. And if we take that same DNA post-pandemic, post-vaccine, I think we'll, that's a huge win for leaders. And what I've witnessed, what I've interviewed, where I've worked in some of my consulting, are leaders indeed now not just saying, oh, you know, let's embrace change, but we can do this. How might we do this as a team? So a lot more collaborative inclusivity with the team. Uh, and but if we if we forget, if we if we go back to the old way, the old normal, uh, Haley, and sort of allow little bits of incremental change as opposed to thinking big and how we might do things much differently, I'd be disappointed. I really would. So summary, pandemic's proven we can embrace change. Uh, I hope that post-pandemic and when we have the vaccine, that we still have that same systemic type of thinking and push for the stars. You know, mm -hmm. it's the pandemic has perhaps, uh, in a weird way, created our own moonshot that might be a more constant moonshot. Let's try it. Oh, we didn't... We didn't have webcams on before, but now everyone's got a webcam on. Fantastic. I mean, there's embracing change. I have a 17, 14, and 13-year-old. I taught them to play uh, blackjack. So, great. Now they've got a life skill. They're playing blackjack because we were stuck at home and we needed to teach them something. So we taught them blackjack, right? There you go. <laughs> yeah, why not? Right? <laughs> why not? Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I'm curious for those who maybe aren't quite where they want to be, they're not maybe in a formal leadership position yet within their organization, can they follow the lessons in this book and really use it as a, a, a guide, so to speak, to getting to where they want to be? Do they work that way? Well, what the book is not is a strategic book. It's not going to teach you about strategy, right? There are hordes of other folks that are much clever than I am teaching you about how to how to do strategy. And it's not a how do I innovate? It's not the, the innovator's dilemma book either, right? So I want to be clear what it's not. Lots of great books out there about strategy and innovation. What it is, is a humanistic book. And what I believe is going to happen, and, and perhaps timing is everything as a result of the pandemic, that when we emerge from this, the employee population and, and society in general is going to demand for a more caring, touching, humanistic organization, team, leader, you know, fill in the blank. And is it a recipe or a playbook or at least a guidepost of some sort? Perhaps. I mean, it'd be touched if someone thought that way. So, so thanks for bringing that potential up. Uh, if it touches one leader, however, just to change their way fantastic. Uh, if it inspires soon-to-be leaders in coming right out of the blocks and saying, I'm going to be that type of caring leader who commits to balance, who's relatable, who plays for meaning, who's curious and embraces change and so forth, then I'm even more inspired by those types of leaders because they're from the beginning not going to be the lead scare win leader. They're going to be a lead care win type of leader. <laughs> Dan, final question. Where can people find the book? When is it out? Oh, uh, it comes out the 29th of September. I should really <laughs> remember this. <laughs> 29th of September, uh, independent bookshops, bookshops uh, in general. The easiest way probably to find out where is go to, very simply, leadcarewin.com and lots of details there to, to find out where and when you can pick it up. Perfect. Dan, thanks again for coming on the show. Appreciate your insight. 
Thanks for having me back, Haley. And um, you know what? Stay safe. Will do. You as well. That's Dan Pontefract, founder and CEO of the Pontefract Group, as well as the author of the upcoming book, Lead, Care, Win. This is BIV Today. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow.